For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, Chartered Accountants and Business Advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Welcome to today's Entrepreneur, a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business. My name is Dan Delmar, along with my co-host for Landau's Josh Miller. Josh, how are you? Excellent, Dan. Great. Uh, now we introduce our guest for the evening. It's a voice uh, that's been part of the CJD family for a very long time. Rosh Fraser. 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 Not Fraser, but Fraser. Fraser. Fraser <laughs> Furniture. See, I, I knew I would mess it up. Uh, Ross, welcome to CJD. Thank you very much, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice to have you. And of course, uh, we've we've heard you on CJD many uh, for for years, uh, advertising with us. And uh, now we get to sort of get into uh, to what's behind this business. Um, worth mentioning, 131 years old. Dan, you know, the, the show's going to go by really quickly. 131 years. We won't hear about all the previous generations, but I'm sure we'll get some great stories and even better insight. So, 131 years. Let's jump right into it. Ross, um, perhaps you can just, I mean, there's a lot of people very familiar with what Fraser Furniture is, but perhaps you can just set us up and explain what what does the store do today? What does the business represent and do today? And then maybe you can take us back to some beginning. Absolutely. Josh, uh, Fraser Furniture today is, uh, we have an 80,000 square foot uh, showroom with an incredible selection of uh, fine furniture and furnishings from around the world. Um, whether your tastes are traditional, transitional, uh, contemporary, rustic, or modern, we have an incredible selection of fine goods for every room in the home. Do you cater to the masses? Do we cater to the masses? We 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 don't put. Uh, I mean, our, I would say that our level is from the medium price point up to the high high price point. Uh, basically, uh, we we don't go below a certain quality level because we're not comfortable putting the Fraser name on that product. But if you're looking for a sofa, say, in the uh, $1,500 range, a nice starting uh, price point sofa, we have a, a terrific selection. And if you're looking to spend $15,000 on the most expensive sofa in the world with the finest fabrics, we can do that for you, too. Now, take us back uh, as far back as you'd like to go. Uh, the business started in 1880. Take us back to, I don't know how far the beginning, certainly to where you got in, but maybe a little bit before and the buildup of Fraser along the way. Well, Fraser Furniture began in 1880. Uh, my great-grandfather and his brother uh, started out in the auction business, so they were auctioning uh, the uh, estates of the Montreal's finest uh, homes at the time, including the artwork, the silver, the jewelry, and the fine furniture. And that's where we became uh, into the furniture business. Um, and it's transitioned over the years to, to include the, the sales of, of used furniture and more recently new furniture imports from around the world. So one thing the business has done is it's evolved throughout the years and throughout the generations to, to change to satisfy the changing needs of our cu customers. So when you grew up in the household, it was all business all the time? Oh, not really. My my father was a fun-loving uh, character who who loved the business and loved to travel, and uh, we certainly learned that from him. Uh, it wasn't all business all the time. Um, my two sisters and and me were both were all uh, exposed to the business from the beginning, um, and there was never any pressure put on any of us to actually become involved in the business. So, how did you get into this business then? Well. I got into this business, uh, I was not the type that uh, would have been interested in being forced into the family business. Many uh, family businesses, the kids are expected to join the family business and I really wanted to go out and do my own thing. Uh, so when I graduated from Queen's University with my degree in business, uh, my father uh, was a very wise soul and at the time he basically said, Ross, uh, go out and get some experience in the world, make your mistakes with somebody else, and if at some point in the future you're interested in joining me, I'd be very pleased to discuss it with you. Um, part of, one of the problems with a lot of family businesses is when the kids come right into the family business, they learn all dad's mistakes, dad and mom's, dad's and mom's mistakes in the same way, and they continue to do them, and he wanted to make sure that I brought in a, that I, if I did join the business, that I brought in a totally different perspective for the future. Was it tough at that age to sort of go away from the family business? Did, did you want to sort of stick around and have that comfort factor? Not at all. I was really interested in, in, in moving away and experiencing the world. Uh, I ended up uh, working for Sears Canada in the Toronto area for six years. I got a terrific base from 
what at that time was the finest retailer uh, merchandiser in, in Canada and the States at the time, and uh, I got a tremendous experience, which also very much helped me with my dad's team when I joined them because I joined with with some experience and with some, uh, you know, with a with a tremendous benefit in bringing into the business. When you were at Sears, was it in the furniture department, or was it all types of? Not at all. I was in general management, so I was I ran various departments in the stores. I was a merchandise controller responsible for all of the inventory of one huge store, and I was a national buyer at the head office downtown for three years. In my final three years uh, with with Sears, you know, Dan, when we're talking about generational businesses. And you raised an excellent point before. Sometimes it's an automatic or they, they think, okay, the next one, they'll just come in. But there's a lot of wise entrepreneurs that say, you know what? Learn elsewhere. Let's see what other people do. You don't come into the business. It won't be nepotism right away. Uh, and go bring, and maybe when you're ready, you can come back and share that information with the family and and help us out or bring a different perspective. Because just coming in fresh with no experience Sometimes there's a lack of respect from the other people around, so even then. And I'm wondering what what Ross brought back to the business with him, so I'll ask him that in a second. Our guest on today's entrepreneur, Ross Ross Fraser of Fraser Furniture. It's uh, 7.15 right now on CJ. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, Chartered Accountants and Business Advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 718, welcome back to today's entrepreneur. Our guest this evening, Ross uh, Fraser of Fraser Furniture. And uh, Josh, we're talking about uh, how uh, Ross uh, is fourth generation now uh, uh, in the business. And um, the interesting aspect to this is that a lot of people in family businesses feel comfortable just spending their entire lives in that one business. It's comfortable, it's familiar. Um, but Ross took a, a bit of a different route. And and he went, to, and certainly with the with the guidance of his father, who suggested to gain some experience elsewhere. Uh, and uh, as Ross was pointing out before, he, he got some experience, gained it at a, at a large company, uh, Sears, as a matter of fact. So what brought you back into Fraser Furniture, Ross? Well, that's a, an interesting question, Josh. Uh, around... Uh, after six years in, in Toronto with Sears, I had a, a very interesting career going. I think I could have been very happy and done very well uh, within that environment. Um, when my father began to have some health problems, uh, at which time he felt that it was necessary to try and try and convince me that it was a good time for me to consider coming back and joining the family business. And after looking at all of the uh, potential and the benefits of the business itself, uh, it was a pretty hard thing not to accept to come back and, and take advantage of uh, of the tremendous opportunity that was there to run this particular business. So I ended up coming back and uh, and I haven't looked back since. It's been a wonderful ride since 1984 when I joined the business. Was it, you know, you were going from reporting to people that you didn't know to kind of working with reporting to, I don't know what the exact structure was, but working reporting with your dad. Was there any Did you guys have similar styles? How did you deal with the differences and your knowledge from an outside firm? Well, I think my dad had a very different style. He was uh, was certainly a very unique individual, Uh, lots of fun to be around and to work with. And uh, at the time when I first arrived, he actually... um, had me in charge of a of another division of our business, so I was basically running a separate division. I was very involved in the general manager management of the retail uh, business and the furniture stores, uh, but at the time I was actually running a manufacturing business that we had in in the office furniture area. So we weren't on top of each other full time, and yet he was exposing me to all of the general management uh, challenges and decisions that were being made on the overall business. So it was it was a very good way to to begin. Was it difficult to gain the respect of the other management group that was there? As a matter of fact, because of my experience outside, uh, it wasn't uh, difficult at all. It actually worked very, very well because I did bring, uh, you know, a successful uh, experience with me and some new ideas to the table that they were very interested in having me involved in the team at that time. So it worked out very well. And what were some of those new ideas, and was there any resistance to change? Often with the younger generation we see, especially with technology, uh, we see that resistance. Well, there, there, there wasn't a tremendous resistance to change. I mean, I, I, I virtually arrived in the business to learn the business the way it was running at that time. Uh, the challenge I had was I was, I, I was working in one aspect of the business and for, for a couple of years, and probably the biggest mistake that I made 
since I joined the business was I didn't I didn't uh, ask my dad all of the detailed questions about the business that I should have because in 1986. Uh, about a year and a half later, he had a debilitating stroke, which left him unable to communicate, and he lived for three more years un- un- unable to communicate, and I didn't, I didn't unfortunately have the chance to pick his brain the way I would have, you know, had his health continued to be, to be strong, so. So was there, was there any specific item, uh, you know, coming back to Dan's question, that you brought in that was new to Fraser Furniture that really seemed to, to work well? I think, I mean, he had the experience on the merchandising side and the purchasing side around the world. He had developed relationships across Europe and the States with, with the finest manufacturers, so that was terrific. I guess I brought a younger spirit of management into the organization. My people, uh, ideas of managing our people were, were a bit different from him. Uh, he, he came through the war years. He was an officer in the Second World War, and I was a much more management by you know, by by proxy with our management by 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 teamwork, and uh, I, I I've always believed that uh, if we surround ourselves with great people, you know, let them be a big part of the decisions, and uh, and in that way they buy into it, and we are a much stronger business because of it. Ross Fraser, our guest on today's Entrepreneur at 7:23 on CJ80. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, Chartered Accountants and Business Advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Welcome back to today's Entrepreneur. And uh, Josh, just like last week, we have a family business, uh, tragedy strikes, and then the next generation now is is supposed to uh, pick things up and continue on. And and Ross uh, Fraser of Fraser Furniture, um, tragedy struck your father, and then you find yourself in this uh, in this business. Obviously, you couldn't rely on his expertise. So, how did you get through that, and and how did you learn the business? Well, uh, I was very very fortunate in that uh, when my father uh, had his illness, I I ended up uh, taking over his very experienced management team. Uh, I had the benefit of uh, his uh, controller who'd been with him for 37 years, his store manager had been with him for 35 years, his office manager had been with him for 40 years. So I was able over the the subsequent few years to uh, get all of the details in the running of our business from his key people who he had trained very, very well. So it was a very... Uh, it was an unfortunate uh, situation, but I was able to take advantage of the experience that we had within the organization. I'm sure they were used to your dad's style that was likely quite different than your own. Can you describe the differences and how you kind of used your own to, to get in? Well, my dad's style was probably a lot more autocratic uh, than, than my style. I, I'm very much a... a, a believe in democ- democracy within a management team. I don't claim to have all the answers. Uh, I, I've surrounded myself with a, with a great group of, of young uh, management uh, people that have some great, great experience. And I feel that a collective decision on most things is far better than, than, than me drawing straws and hoping I've made the right decision. So I, I very, very much believe in, in making decisions using the experience of the group uh, around the table. How was the transition for them, for the employees? Uh, did they take it well? Uh, the employees did take it well. I mean, I think, I think uh, I've tried to establish a culture of teamwork and, uh, and uh, that everybody gets tremendous respect in our organization. And we're a big, big organization, but still small enough that we have most people in most positions, we only have one person doing the job. So it's very important that they understand the importance of that position and that they they take responsibility for it, and I very much try to instill that kind of a culture in the business. And uh, I mean, we're in the customer service business; we're in the relationship building business with our customers. So it's really important that every customer that walks in the store feels the same appreciation from anybody they might come across in their in their visit to our store. So you had the management team to to get close with and learn the business. What about the the operator? Like you, you no longer had your dad maybe to bounce ideas off of or perhaps be your mentor. Were there any people outside the business that you ended up relying on or, or helping you out? Absolutely. We were very fortunate. My father uh, having been a Harvard biz- Business School graduate, was a firm believer in having an outside board of directors for a family company. So we were very fortunate in that when I took over for him, from him, I had a very experienced board of directors who were there uh, to assist me and to uh, bounce ideas off. Uh, we were very fortunate to have uh, Stephen Jaroslowski, uh, Montreal's 
a very famous investment counselor, uh, has been on our board of directors since uh, 1955, I think. He's been a tremendous help to me over the years uh, in, in guiding us and moving us in a positive direction. Uh, Mike Forsyth, uh, who is the former uh, uh, chief financial officer for IntraWest, uh, was a classmate of mine at Queen's. He's been on our board for many, many years. So I have some very strong financial minds that are there to assist me. Uh, my forte is not the financial side, side of the business, so I felt it was very important for me to have a strong base on the board of directors. And certainly when you're running a business that's 131 years old, uh, certainly a lot of issues to deal with there, uh, certainly a reputation to maintain and an image to maintain. You recently went, underwent uh, an image change, Ross, and we'll talk about that after the break um, and how, how that worked and how that played with the customer base as well. It's uh, 7.30 on CJD. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Inspiring stories from outstanding business people. This is today's entrepreneur. My name is Dan Delmar, along with Josh Miller of Fuller Landau. And our profile this evening is Ross Fraser of Fraser Furniture, a name very familiar to CJD listeners, of course. 131 years in business, Ross. It's really incredible. And uh, your company has seen uh, many recessions over the years, even a depression, obviously. <laughs> uh, now, you came into the business um, on the uh, around uh, the uh, one recession, uh, in the early 90s. Um, tell us about your experience there and uh, tell us about how the business is adjusting now uh, during the current economic climate. Uh, is it tougher, uh, easier than the last recession and how are you coping? Well, Dan, the, the recession in the early 90s was a very, very difficult time uh, for us as a business and for most, most retail businesses. Uh, we found that uh, for the volume of sales that we were Having, we had one building too many. Our main store was over on De La Savanne, not far from our current location, which we were leasing, and I had bought the, uh, the building on Devonshire Road, 8300 Devonshire, uh, in 1989. And uh, at that point, we realized that we had the space in our own building to move our entire store into the building. Uh, so we did that. Uh, we still had three years remaining on our lease on uh, De La Savanne, which we continued to pay, and uh, and we, we lived up to our commitment for the three years with that. But in moving our main store into our own building, we, ha we uh, were able to achieve some real benefits for our customers. First of all, uh, we had all of our merchandise under one roof instead of two stores. We had one location with our entire selection. We also had our warehouse and service department on site right there, which was a tremendous benefit to our clients. Um, also, in doing that, we were able to uh, to reduce our uh, our operating costs by about a half a million dollars, which helped us ride through a very diff difficult recession until the mid-90s. Is that something you feel you were proactive about, or was it very reactionary? I think we probably, if we'd made the decision a year earlier, would have been a good mm. thing, but uh, these things you never you never... Uh, we don't have a crystal ball. It's difficult to know, and I think our timing on doing it was was perfect. Uh, it ended up uh, working out very, very well for us. Uh, our customers uh, have gotten to know us at our Devonshire location, and we can provide all our services under one roof, with that, which I think is a tremendous benefit to us as a business and to our clients. I would, I would imagine one of the issues that you deal with, not just recession, but all the time, is because you have so much, I mean, you mentioned 80,000 square foot uh, of floor space, there's a lot of inventory. There's a lot of goods, a lot of purchasing. Uh, what are maybe some of the uh, inventory management processes that you've improved along the years? Well, inventory management is a is a is a uh, a real challenge challenge for all uh, all case goods retailers like ourselves. Um, it's it's always a challenge uh, when we're out buying at the markets around the world, trying to find unique uh, quality furniture for our clients. Uh, we have to buy from any different tastes. Uh, if, we, if I just bought what I personally uh, like, I would probably look after 5% of our clientele. So we are looking for beautiful things that cover many, many different, a broad spectrum of, of looks and styles. And we have to do our best to buy, to the best of our ability, the things we think we can sell and the market would like to have. It's constantly a challenge. Uh, every buyer in this, in this uh, arena uh, makes some very good decisions and makes some decisions that don't work out. The ones that aren't 
as popular as we hope they might be, they become our markdowns and our loss leaders that drive our sales and drive a lot of clients into our store also. So it's an important uh, piece of that, uh, that equation. As far as w how things have changed, certainly with technology, uh, we can have a much stronger tracking of which, uh, which purchases, which styles, which manufacturers uh, are performing better, and also uh, you know, which ones we can make a better margin on than others. So technology has helped us a lot in analyzing the purchases that we made and the success we've had. Do you measure pretty much everything that you do? We try to measure it uh, in the best we can. A lot of it is gut fi feel. You still, you arrive at a market and you see a new collection and it's your gut feel. Is it different enough from what you have? Is it different from what the, the rest of the market is showing? Is the price point correct? Is the quality right? Is the finish right? There's many decisions. It's not, you cannot have a computer make your decisions for this kind of purchasing. It, it's gut feel and I'm, I'm fortunate to be surrounded with some uh, some quality design people in my my marketing manager and my design director and we do the purchasing together now Fraser furniture that's been around 131 years I imagine the style of product that you've been offering has changed over the years and and Dan alluded to before about an image change how do you take a 131 year old company and make it fresh I would imagine that it's not just product it's image it's a little bit of everything Maybe you can explain to us how Fraser Furniture freshened its look. Well, Josh, we, we came uh, through uh, the, the 2000s uh, where it was a very good business time for most retailers. Uh, the challenge was that w with it was uh, we didn't have, we were so busy keeping up with our deliveries, we really didn't have time to evolve our business. And Fraser Furniture over the years has constantly tried to evolve for the changing markets and to be a leader uh, as far as the trends and that kind of thing went. Uh, when the recession hit in 2008, when the markets uh, uh, changed forever in 2008, uh, we were forced to take a hard look at what we were going to do moving forward. So in uh, 2009 was a difficult year for all retailers. In early 2010, we made the decision um, w at a period when most, most retailers were cutting costs and eliminating uh, uh, employees, etc., I decided it was a great time to reinvest in our business, to use our team, to make all of the changes that we never had a chance to make. So we decided to look in every department at every every thing we do in business and see how we could be better and how we could provide better service for our clients. So in that, we went through a whole process of analyzing our, our, our merchandise selection, our relationships with our suppliers, um, the service we were providing to our customers, and we decided that it was a perfect time to refresh the business, rejuvenate the business. We realized that uh, trends were getting more contemporary. Our store had more and more contemporary furniture in it as we were following the trends and leading the trends. And we realized that, uh, that it was time for Fraser Furniture to, to refresh itself to become attractive to a younger, more contemporary client. Is that a, a group effort or is that a single person's vision? This is a group effort. Uh, the market was certainly moving in a, in a different direction, and we had to make sure we were at the forefront of that. So in, in conjunction with my, uh, my sales and marketing manager uh, and other key people within the business, we developed, we de developed a plan uh, to refresh ourselves so that we would remain a relevant, uh, a relevant business for, you know, for the furniture consumer of today. Many entrepreneurs would, would think that would be a, a very risky move to do that in the middle of a recession, to, to, to do the energy, the expense to go through that. Uh, why did you decide to do that now? I felt uh, it, it was the perfect timing. You know, fortunately, we're very strong financially, so we decided to use our resources to reinvest for the future. Now's the perfect time to do it at a time when, when most stores are not spending any money at all. They're just hanging on for dear life. We felt it was a perfect time to reinvest, uh, reinvent ourselves, um, and the process, it went through all of our selection of furniture, et cetera, but it also, we also ended up uh, uh, putting our corporate logo on the table, our, our branding, which was something that was very close to me. I loved our, our traditional branding, but we put that on the table, and the expert told us that uh, you know, our, our current branding was certainly very strong, but looked very traditional and very expensive. And these are things we, if we're very interested in attracting the 35-year-old uh, doctor, lawyer, scientist, whatever, we would, a younger brand would be much more helpful in getting them to walk into our store.
And I take it the costs of rebranding and sprucing up your image uh, are lower now than they would be if we weren't in a recession. Yes, probably. It was more a perfect time internally because we had the people and the time to really do the job correctly. And we also uh, worked with uh, the outside creative uh, people. Uh, Rinaldi Communications did all of our branding with us, and we had a, a very positive process as we challenged each other to create a brand that was reflective of Fraser's history and its solid, uh, you know, solid uh, experience and also with a, with a nice, refreshed brand. Coming up in a second, we'll bring in uh, Michael Newton to the conversation, managing partner at Fuller Landau. We'll discuss a bit more in depth, uh, Ross, about family businesses and especially making that transition, uh, just like the one you went through, uh, taking the business over from your father. Ross, a Fraser, a Fraser Furniture. Uh, more on the way on today's Entrepreneur at 745. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Inspiring stories from outstanding business people. Today's entrepreneur, uh, Dan Delmar, along with Josh Miller of Fuller Landau. Our guest this evening, Ross Fraser of Fraser Furniture. And we also bring in Michael Newton to the conversation. Michael is a managing partner at Fuller Landau. Welcome, Michael. Thanks for having me. And uh, so we're going to chat a bit about uh, family businesses, in particular making that transition, Josh, the one that, that Ross made with his father. You know, in, in 131 years, Ross is the fourth generation. But what we didn't ask, and we won't ask just yet, but maybe there's a fifth generation. And what I would turn to, to Michael and ask him uh, with, the, you know, with his experience in dealing with transition of family businesses is when, you're, when an entrepreneur is thinking about succession and thinking about the next generation, what are some of the things that he might have to think about or some of the obstacles he might have to overcome when trying to bring his kids into the business? Well, I think one of the first things you have to look at is, are the kids capable of going into the business? Do they want to be in the business? Uh, there's a very uh, ugly term. It's called pruning the family tree. And unfortunately, in many cases, that ends up being the story that, uh, that, has, to, that has to follow through. That fit has to be there, that the individual needs to, uh, to want to go into the business, wants to, has to be capable of doing it. It's nice to know that you know, the next generation is, uh, is really high on doing it, but do they have the capabilities? And I think that the, the parent who's in charge at the time needs to look at a couple of things. Uh, one of them, as I said, the fit that, 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 that individual. The other really is where should that child start? Should that child come out of university and start in the family business? Or should he or she uh, be sent away to work for somebody else to get some experience? And there's a couple of things that, that really come into play. One of them is if they go somewhere else, the moment they walk in, they walk in with a level of credibility uh, that they don't really get if they pop out of university and have been working in shipping for 10 years and all of a sudden uh, find their way into, uh, into the executive suite uh, when uh, everybody looks around and goes, hey, wait a second, uh, you know, generation two, three, or four, or little Johnny all of a sudden is taking over and has really got no experience. So I think, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs really have to decide whether they actually want to send their kids away for a little while, which is a very difficult, uh, difficult decision to, uh, to be made, but it's definitely something that has to be considered. Well, I guess it's also a question of are they thinking longer term or are they only thinking in the immediate? And, but what about the styles? I mean, certainly mom or dad that's running the business today might have a very different style from Johnny or Jenny that might come into the business tomorrow. How could they maybe overcome that? Well, I think that as, as uh, parents uh, who have children, ultimately those children try and push away and do what their parents didn't do when they become parents. Uh, I think you see a lot of similarities once they hit the uh, hit the floor in the, in the business in the sense that some of them want to say, well, dad was too dictatorial or dad was too autocratic. I'm going to be a little more democratic, a little more friendly, a little more client relations, a little more personnel relations. And sometimes they overcompensate. Uh, and it takes them a little while to kind of fit through. If you happen to be lucky where that next generation stays on and that transition is relatively smooth, what you end up with is you end up with... Um, kind of finding the middle road, I think, at the end of the day between dad and, and, and maybe your overcompensation. The problem you have or the unfortunate situation you have is when somebody is thrown into a situation, unfortunately due to illness or sickness uh, or death, when somebody all of a sudden has to turn and say, hey, wait a second, uh, do I come in and be like dad or mom or am I going to really try and assert my own style? Ross, did, did you feel the need to find your own style or did it just work out that way based on, on your personality? I don't. I, I think I, I just let my personality take over. Uh, my experience uh, in management was, you know, was of a certain way, and uh, I wasn't comparing myself to my father. I was working with a great group of people, and we just everything just seemed to flow from there. 
We'll uh, get your words of wisdom for today's entrepreneur in a moment and talk more about family businesses with uh, Michael Newton. It's uh, today's entrepreneur on CJD. It's 7.53. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, Chartered Accountants and Business Advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Remaining moments of today's entrepreneur, our guests this evening, Ross Fraser of Fraser Furniture and Michael Newton, managing partner at Fuller Landau. We're talking about family businesses and making that transition, Josh, and uh, how uh, there could be some complications on the way. And, and uh, you know, Ross took over from his father. And, uh, well, let's look ahead now, uh, Ross, and, and what uh, what's going to happen uh, when it's time for you to step aside. Have you thought about that yet? Well, it's something, obviously, that uh, does creep into your mind uh, since I'm uh, past my mid-50s at this point in time. Uh, I do have uh, three uh, very talented young boys, uh, 21, eight, sorry, 21, 19, and 16. Uh, the question is, uh, you know, will they be interested? Uh, we've exposed all three of them to the business over the years. They've all worked and helped out and are very aware of, of the business, but uh, it's very hard to say whether their careers and their interests will take them in the direction uh, of being interested in taking on the family business and, uh, as Michael said, whether they would be capable down the road of, of taking it on. So it's a question that, that we're asking, but we're, there, there's no guarantees in, in this kind of situation. And gaining the right knowledge is not always the easiest thing. Michael, when, when kids are coming into the business, uh, have you seen ways or methods that have worked for them to gain knowledge, whether it's inside the business or outside? Well, I mean, if you're going to ask my preference, the first is to try and get some experience outside the family business for a couple of years, just to kind of get their feet wet, uh, understand the environment that, or the working environment that doesn't show any preferential family treatment. And that could be good or bad in many cases. I mean, sometimes you're overly difficult or overly harsh on your kids in, in your own business. So I think that's important. Uh, the other thing I think that I, that I like is, you know, the concept of having the Family Business Council or having the board uh, assigned. I think there's a lot of expertise that's going to go into that, that comes out of those groups that ultimately provides a, a sounding board, I think, for the next generation. Because the reality is, let's face it, the next generation's goals and objectives and the way they see life is certainly not the way their parents or their grandparents did. And what drives them can be very different. It doesn't mean they can't be successful. It doesn't mean they can't, um, you know, the toe the line. But uh, I think ultimately at the end of the day, I think they really need to be looking outside. I think the younger generation comes out much more educated than previous generations. Sometimes that comes with a little bit of arrogance that uh, needs to be dusted off of them. Uh, and sometimes working somewhere else will do that. And sometimes they listen to outside people, as you said, much better than they would their own parents. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's clear that uh, if I'm trying to get a message across to my kids, it's much easier to have somebody else give it to them than it is for me to give it to them. So I'm sure there's no difference once they hit the, uh, hit the workforce. I'll mm -hmm. remember that next time I see them. Yeah, you, you do Ross. that. I'm sure they will too. <laughs> <laughs> 131 years. Uh, I know you haven't been there, but for the, for the many years that you've been there, uh, what one piece of advice would you give to today's entrepreneur? Well, Josh, I, I think I would say uh, work hard. Uh, nothing is easy. No, nothing worthwhile comes easily. You have to work hard for it. Uh, be passionate about what you do. Uh, surround yourself with the best people you can find. Train them really well. Respect them and trust them. Give them responsibility and trust them. And they will, they will go to the ends of the earth for you. Also, uh, always remain focused on the consumer. The customer is your lifeblood. Uh, it's very important to remain focused on the consumer, and the consumer is changing. The tastes are changing constantly. Don't be afraid to change and evolve your business as you move forward because it is absolutely necessary to remain strong. And, Dan, the takeaway I get from this, and there's so many things to learn, we've only even touched the surface of the story, is that you trust the people around you. Gain their knowledge. You don't. The entrepreneur cannot know everything. Uh, we certainly learned that in Ross's story where he came into a business, he used the management team, he was he worked with the management team, worked with the people around him, outside advisors, to gain that important knowledge. Trust those people, as he said, gain that knowledge, and only everybody can be better off all pushing in the same direction. Ross Fraser, Fraser Furniture. Uh, really interesting to hear your story and get, uh, get the story behind uh, what we've uh, all heard for years here on CJAD. Uh, thanks so much for coming in tonight. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It was my pleasure. And there's so much more, Dan. Maybe it'll be another show one day. I think we'll need a part two eventually, We Josh. might need a part two. Uh, Michael Newton, a managing partner at Fuller Landau, thanks again for your advice on family businesses, and uh, we'll talk next week. 
Thank you very much. Michael, will be, Michael will be here next week. He will, filling in in the big chair, Josh, uh, filling in for you. So we'll tune in uh, next week to today's entrepreneur. Uh, don't forget, Florlando's Lando, website, rather, www.flmontreal.com. Have a good night.